This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at thebatmanuniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. In 2008, a podcast was created with one goal. To bring Bat fans around the world news related to movies, comics, video games, television, merchandise, and so much more. And now, the Batman Universe Podcast has returned. everyone, welcome to the latest episode of the TV Podcast. Uh, today, Scott and Otto are with me, and we are here to discuss the DC, DC Studio Slate. Uh, that's right, as predicted, um, when we recorded the last episode, we knew it was going to happen. Uh, it was almost bound to happen at the last possible day of the month, and that's exactly what happened. Um, it released on the 31st of January, um, so it did meet that January deadline that James Gunn himself said it was going to happen, uh, but we have the slate, and we're going to talk about all the different projects that are that were announced. We're going to talk about some of the projects that weren't announced, but uh, we have some updates on, so we're going to talk about a bunch of different things. So, uh, the big thing is, I, I want to talk about first the rollout of the announcements rather than the things that were announced. Um, I thought it was interesting because the day prior to the announcement, there was a rumor going around online saying that there was select media that was invited to the Warner Brothers lot in Burbank to specifically hear um, some of the, you know, the, some of the slates and talk about it and were, they were able to ask questions and some of those questions ended up bleeding into some other things. But I will say the, the thing that I was extremely interested on, which at the time when this happened, I was actually out of town and I woke up that morning thinking, all right, it's got to happen. When is it going to happen? Cause it's got to happen today. And it when they announced it, it not only was announced, it was like a blanket across everywhere. Um, they had a YouTube video, they had a TikTok from the official DC account, they had Twitter videos from James Gunn. Every video was the exact same thing, but it was all over the place. So I appreciate the fact that it wasn't like, hey, you had to just read a press release, and that was the that was the extent of what was going on. They had a six minute video that James Gunn explained some of the projects and also explained some of the. I guess, understanding of what is to come with the future of the slate. Um, So I thought that was really cool because it's nice to see a, you know, unified front when it comes to announcing this stuff, because that's something that I feel like we've been lacking of. What did you guys think of that? I was excited for the whole slate and just, you know, this idea that, you know, now we have what this vision is going to be. And it seems like it's very, um, you know, there is a connection to it, but there's also a lot of wiggle room for outside projects. And so it's just, you know, kind of gives people the best of both worlds. So you're not like too beholden to like a canon, like there's an official canon and like, you know, else worlds or whatever they want to call it. So it's just nice that we have that wiggle room so there can be creative risks taken and we're not like stuck in you know, MCU 2.0 or something. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I I could be wrong, but I don't remember uh, in the past. I mean, I think there was eventually after some of the Snyder movies had come out, there was some, there was some sort of a slate that was released eventually, but uh, I don't actually remember at the very beginning before anything had come out, there being this, this sort of plan. So I think the nice thing was that there is a concrete plan. Uh, There is a, a, um, someone in charge of it. I think also it's a very smart move for them from a business 
perspective because I think the nature of the fandom is what it is. There will be always be, there'll always be speculation uh, about this and that, and people will read far in far more into rumors than they should, and that I think can sometimes create uh, perceptions rightly or wrongly among uh, among the audience. And so this is a good way to I think get out in front of that. And just say, well, you know, this this is not the complete slate, but this is what we're doing. Uh, so there's no need to have any rumors or speculation. This is the slate that we're going with. Yeah, and speaking of that slate, there was there was a slate. I want to say it was after Batman vs Superman came out. I think it was before Batman vs. Or I think it was after Batman vs Superman. I can't remember for a fact, but there was a special that was on the CW, and Jeff Johns was there, and Kevin Smith was hosting the you know, the little thing that they were doing, whatever it was, and they were showcasing some of the projects and they, that's where they announced we have a flash movie. We have a cyborg movie. We have a green lantern core. We have all these different projects that a lot of them obviously never came to be, but that was the only other time that we've seen something. And like, you could to an extent say DC fandom um, was that, but there was nothing that was like really announced. It was just, we got information about stuff that had already previously been announced in some way, shape or form. So that was kind of cool, but all right, so let's get to the slate. Cause I mean, obviously that's, that's the big deal of what was released. So there was a total of 10 projects that were actually announced. Um, so they specifically said that this beginning slate is called is chapter one. It's called Gods and Monsters. There's five new films and five new television series for HBO Max that are already in development. Um, specifically, we already knew about the Superman movie. Um, that's going to be happening. Uh, they have got a release date for that on July 11th, 2025. So I appreciate that. One, it's right around the corner. That's literally coming up in just under or just over two years at this moment. They did date the Batman, um, which for now is called the Batman Part Two, uh, for October of 2025. So we know that um, there's, you know, there's going to be the second film is going to be coming in just over two years as well. Um, but that's not one of the ten. Um, they specifically the film projects are Superman Legacy, which we already knew is going to be written by Gunn. It says the film will hit theaters July 11, 2025, and focus on Superman balancing his Kryptonian heritage with his human upbringing. The Authority, uh, which will have the Wildstorm characters, will join the DCU as members of the Authority, take matters into their own hands to do what they believe is right. There is Supergirl, Woman of Tomorrow, uh, this science fiction adventure, which will be based on Tom King's amazing award-winning recent comic story, presents a Supergirl viewers are not used to seeing. Uh, Swamp Thing, the film will investigate the dark origins of Swamp Thing. And then we have The Brave and the Bold. The DCU will introduce its Batman and Robin in this unusual father-son story inspired by Grant Morrison's comic series. So just let's just stick with the film projects there for a second. Um, I have to say I'm not super surprised that they're doing a different version of Batman. Um, last week when we talked about our hopes... I mentioned there, I was, you know, I like the idea of there being two Batman. I think it's entirely possible. Um, part of the other part of this slate announcement was that there, there's the potential for other things down the road because um, they are, in fact, going to be using the Elseworlds banner, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But this will be the actual DC universe. And the further details on the Brave and the Bold series is that that series is going to be the place for the Batman of the DC Universe films, but it'll also use that series as a way to introduce other characters. They didn't specifically say, you know, other DC characters or other Batman family or Bat family characters, but they did say at that this movie will be the the moment to bring the Bat family into it, even if they only focus on Damien. They did say that there is every intent to bring more of the Bat family into the films and, well, the DC studio universe that they're creating. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I kind of wonder if we're going to get more than Damien, just by that, like, that hints. I'd, you know, obviously, I don't think we're going to get, like, the whole roster, especially since, you know, by the whole roster, that usually means people cherry pick, like, four or five of them, but like maybe one or two other members, you know, I'm kind of, I'm interested to hear more about it. Like, it's nice to see that it's inspired by like the Grant Morrison stuff. Cause I was a really big fan of that. 
Um, but admittedly, with the current film site, this is probably one of the ones that I'm like. It's not that I'm not excited for, but my my excitement level is kind of pretty subdued. I think the reason being is because you know we have the Batman two coming out and like, I already know what that first one's like. I know how much I loved it and I know what I can kind of expect. And this is kind of like brave and the bold. Like they give me ideas, but it's kind of on a left field. So I don't know what to anticipate. There's no creative people attached or anything. So, you know, something that I'm, I'll be optimistic for, but kind of on the back of back burner right now. Yeah. I think as Scott said, it's, it's really early in the game. Uh, the only thing we have is, uh, the name of the film, kind of what they're, they're going to be introducing Damien and kind of the comic it was inspired by. Um, I mean, I think it's great to your point about having two Batman or two Batman movies, two different Batman movies. I think that's, it's a great thing. Um, I would love for this film to, to work and for them to introduce the Bat family and to get like, I don't know, maybe let's say, at least three or four movies out of them. And then at the same time have, you know, Robert Pattinson's Batman, that world continue to develop, continue to grow, and maybe even get three or four movies out of that one as well. Um, my concern though, is that we might not get that just because I, I wonder how much like one will cannibalize the audience for the other. I, I don't know if that, if that will happen, but I just hope it doesn't because it would be really a shame if, uh, I and mean, you know how much I loved uh, the patents and Batman. It'd be really a shame if uh, if they decide to discontinue that one in favor of uh, this new one. I'm the only thing that concerns me about having two Batman is does that mean that certain elements will not be able to be utilized in other formats? Meaning, does this mean that Matt Reeves, if he had a plan for Robin or he had a plan for introducing members of the Bat Family? Does that mean that there's that he has to adjust his plan because of what's happening with the Brave and the Bold? Um, I can't say, you know, definitively yes or no. I hope not. Um, but I also think that for a lot of us Bat fans and Bat family fans, I think we really want to see the Bat family in film or TV series or whatever in a really good way, or a way that's done very well. And I think that, you know, when you look at some of the stuff that we've gotten oh, the last decade, we've had Gotham, which was it's not great, um, to put it lightly. Um, you, you've got, you know, the upcoming Gotham Knights, which I don't think anybody here is looking forward to. Um, we have other versions of characters that have been utilized. Like there's been characters from the Bat Family that have appeared in some of the other shows. Um you know, like Huntress has popped up in Arrow and things like that. But none of them are the version of the character that I think we all have grown to appreciate. And I think one of the things that I, I get so annoyed with when when there are people who are, you know, doing what they want with the DC Universe or the characters from the DC Universe or more specifically the Bat Family is they take like somebody who is an existing character and they adjust it. Cassandra Kane and Birds of Prey is a perfect example. That was not... Cassandra Kane. That was just somebody that they decided to name Cassandra Kane. And that's annoying because fans of that character are looking forward to that character being in a film. And then they get something that's not the character that they know. So I'm hoping that with the, with a slate and kind of like trying to make sure that the characters stay true to something, some sort of source material. Uh, we can actually see more characters pop up in their true form rather than this. Um, I will say <laughs> there, w there was one thing. Uh, I, I'm just going to throw this out there. There's a lot of projects out there that are currently happening within DC. Uh, Teen Titans Go, Superman and Lois, that James Gunn specifically mentioned. But one that never came up in any interview that I ever saw was Gotham Knights. And I'm pretty sure he's probably looking at that and going... This can't die quick enough. Yeah, probably. He's one of those. He likes to be positive and just not say anything, which is a smart move. You know, it is his employer. You know, it's yeah. one of their, as much as none, no one likes it, it's one of their, you know, projects. But something I did want to say, um, you know, this movie is called The Brave and the Bold. So 
I am hoping that there is the ability to share characters because my assumption based off of that title is that it's going to be a much lighter tone than the Reeves stuff and that I'm hoping the logic behind this is like the Matt Reeves stuff is going to be the super dark, you know, noirish, like, you know, Avenger type of vibe and Brave and the Bulls will be a little bit, you know, not like George Clooney campy or ridiculous or something, but just brighter in tone given the title and the source material for that book title. I've always thought, like, kind of in my head, just, you know, thinking of the character, like, Batman as a character through different sort of stages of his life, and I I think, like, in my head at least, and I think this is partially um, due to the influence of reading, you know, obviously comic stories, uh, in his early days, he's more like the darker loner type that we see in Pattinson's films, and then as he gets older and he has more of a family around him, he becomes more of, like, the the version we see in... um, the first few seasons of Young Justice, where he's still kind of that, he's still kind of that uh, character who's dealing with that that trauma, but uh, he's more of a leader. He's he's less consumed by it. He's kind of gotten over it in in that sense. So he's transitioned to a different phase of 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 a, of a of superhero, and also like he's just a different person. So I think it would be interesting to show that that side of the character as well. Yeah, that's the advantage of obviously having a character who's a little bit older, who's welcomed a little bit more family members into his circle and things like that. So that could be interesting. Um, speaking of some of the other um, specific films, um, obviously we're going to be focusing on Brave and the Bold moving forward because it's a Batman film, but we already knew about the Superman film out of the group. I'm not super surprised by a Swamp Thing film because I feel like that's right up the alley of what James Gunn, where he his roots come from. Um, but I feel like, and obviously none of these films are necessarily written or directed by James Gunn. We only know that Superman Legacy is being written by Gunn. Um, other than him deciding which films are moving forward, I'm curious to see... You know, did they decide these are the films that are going to get made and then they're going to go find writers and directors similar to the approach that Marvel did um, where, like, they have an idea of a group of characters that they want to use and then in turn they want to in they want to make something with that because that's what it feels like it's it's happening based off of the fact that we don't – we've got all these projects but we don't know anybody actually attached to them. But – the one that stands out to me is kind of interesting choice so early on in the beginning of this slate is the authority because I can say I'm not super familiar with a lot of Wildstorm characters um, outside of Grifter recently or not recently but uh, appearing in a Batman book more recent. Um, there's not very many Wildstorm characters that I even have the faintest idea of who they are. I know the authority. Um, comic series that originally came out was big when it first came out, but that was also like ages ago. I know that they had more authority comics down the line. I think there was something during the middle of the New 52 when they introduced the Wild Wildstorm characters, but I don't know anything about them. But based off of what I've read online of people talking about the authority after the fact, it's kind of an interesting choice and kind of one that comes from left field in my opinion. It makes I don't know. I, there was that Superman the Authority book that I thought like people liked. Like I didn't read it personally, so I can't comment on it. But it seemed like I heard a lot of good things from like other comic readers. So there's that, you know. And admittedly, that's kind of why I feel like Swamp Thing was on this slate too. Partially was because we had that Ram V series that got two seasons. They picked it up and extended it, and I hope they do it again because it's amazing. But going back to the Authority, I feel like. There's that, there is that familiarity lately with comic readers, but also like it's that risk with the potential reward to do what James Gunn did with Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, which is to take something relatively unknown to most people and actually get them hyped for it without like fatigue because everyone's seen Superman and Batman movies to death, you know? So here's your chance to usher something new in there and it might not work. So there is that risk, but I also feel like that's why we've only seen the first couple years of this 10-year plan, you know, just in case something falls on its on its face, you know, like they can backpedal it. But I 
I'm 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 kind of curious about that authority film just on that alone. Like it's you know they're probably gonna it's probably just gonna feel very fresh. Yeah, I haven't uh, I haven't read the Superman and, and the Authority book either. Um, but it is written by Grant Morrison, I believe. Which I mean, he's obviously a big influence on what Gunn is planning to do, according to Gunn himself. Um, I also don't <clears throat> know too much about the uh, the Authority them as characters. Uh, but the first thing, it's funny, Scott, you brought up Guardians of the Galaxy, but the first thing that I thought when I saw that, and you know, I did a bit of research onto the characters, um, I thought this was Gunn doing Guardians of the Galaxy. This is his like DC version or attempt at that. That was that was exactly my first thought. Now, I think it, it could work, and you know, obviously I hope it, it does work, but um, my only concern would be uh, if it's about, if it's connected to superhero fatigue, some of these characters in the authority are kind of at least on a very superficial aesthetic level kind of knockoffs of the established characters that we're familiar with so i wonder if that might you know turn some people off right right up front but other than that you know uh, it's it's a shot that you know gun's taking to do something that he's already done before and i think it's it's definitely within his skill set yeah and needless to say the overall film slate is a lot there's a lot of really cool stuff here um, let's jump over to the television side of things. So there was, again, another five projects that were announced. The first one is Creature Commandos, which is a seven-episode animated series in which Amanda Waller creates a black ops team out of monstrous prisoners. Um, and it's said that James Gunn has written all of the episodes of the first season. Uh, next, we have Waller, which will star Viola Davis. Um, and the series will feature Team Peacemaker and be w- will be written by Crystal Henry and Jeremy Carver. Uh, Jeremy Carver comes from Supernatural and Crystal Henry comes from Watchmen. Uh, we've got Booster Gold. Booster Gold uses basic ne- technology from the future to pretend to be a superhero in present day. Then we have Lanterns. This enormous TV event series follows intergalactic cops John Stewart and Hal Jordan as they uncover a dark mystery. Paradise Lost, set in Themyscira, home of the Amazons and birthplace of Wonder Woman, this drama focuses on the genesis and political intrigue of an island of all women. So let's talk about these projects. First up, Creature Commandos. Um, it's interesting that it's the, the first one that seems out of the group that's going to get released is going to be this one, and it has already been in production for quite some time. There's already some um, concept art that's or some art from the series that's already been released. Um I'm not. This is probably one of those ones where I would have never expected it. Um, this also answers the question of what was the other thing that Gunn was writing because he was hinting at that he was writing something for quite some time. So that's it. Um, I like the fact that there's an animated series. One of the things that Gunn said in his announcement was that when they are casting characters, the characters will play over into whatever role appears so creature commandos is part of the overall story just because it's an animation doesn't mean it's not part of what's going on so if an actor appears in creature commandos that actor will also play the live action version into in film and television series uh going forward as well and this and vice versa so if a character pops up in let's say swamp thing that eventually appears in a, another animated series down the line, that same actor will voice that character in the, in the series. And this is, I think, one of the differentials that's between Marvel and DC is that Marvel, more specifically, Disney, who owns Marvel, has always done animation. But a, a lot more recently, they haven't done as much of their own animation outside of films. And they... There was the What If series for Marvel, and they had a lot of the original cast return to voice a lot of the characters that were in it, but it really wasn't specifically part of the overall MCU. And there was some other Marvel series like Modoc. Um, I know there was Hit Monkey. Uh, I believe they were making a Squirrel Girl series. But I don't know what happened with that. I know Hitmonkey just randomly got a green light of a season two after uh, th- this slate got announced. I thought that was kind of weirdly timed. Right. Um, but um, 
that said, um, I appreciate the fact that Warner Brothers, who is is has always been doing animation, like they still do Tom and Jerry films, they still do DC films, they still do Scooby Doo films. That stuff comes out every single year, like on a consistent rotation. So even if they're not doing a ton of it, you know, there's at least three DC films every year, and I know there's at least one. Scooby-Doo movie and one Tom and Jerry movie every single year. And that's not in counting anything else that comes out. They were doing Looney Tunes stuff for a while. Like there's a lot of different stuff that Warner Brothers still has a hand in animation. So I like the fact that they're doing animation, but I like the fact that it's going to be, you know, in, extremely connected to what they're doing in the overall, you know, the overall scheme of things, which then ties into the Waller series because Amanda Waller still being played by Viola Davis will be being in Creature Commandos 2, but she's clearly going to continue to play along. Uh, there were some questions online about, well, does this mean there won't be a Peacemaker Season 2? And I think if you actually watch Peacemaker, the way things kind of ended, it makes sense for Peacemaker's team to exist, but exist not necessarily in the forefront and have something like Amanda Waller being in the forefront instead, be, based off of what the events of what happened at the end of uh, Season 1 of Peacemaker. Um, so that's really cool. So out of the rest of them... Um, Booster Gold, as I'm sure it's going to be a comedy series, it, it, that should be pretty good. Lanterns is being described as a true detective esque story, which is kind of cool. And then Paradise Lost, they described that as Game of Thrones esque. So there's they're 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 specifically naming series like True Detective, Game of Thrones. They're very very big, have good money thrown at them. They're not they're not. They're not, you know, hiding and shying away from the fact that they're trying to make sure that they have these like amazingly large series that that can compete with the likes of stuff like Game of Thrones or True Detective. Honestly, feel like a lot of that is really part of the overarching plan. As plan, you know, we were you're talking earlier about how like the movie slate, like you know, having these different projects ranging from Superman and Batman all the way to Swamp Thing. And I think the TV really reflects kind of what I think is going on here, which is they're picking genres and, you know, trying to cover a widespread. So it's not everything, not everything's the same genre. You know, you have your, your crime thriller, you have your, you know, like you said, the game of Thrones, you know, the sword and fantasy genre is covered. You know, you kind of cover your bases. You have something that's campy and cartoony and fun and something that's more of a comedy, you know. So I feel like that's just kind of the logic behind this whole thing, though, is, you know, you have all these different just aspects that they can play in. So maybe there's a realization, too, that maybe not everybody has to see everything they can pick and choose, but there's something for everybody. You know, if horror is more of your jam, you have Swamp Thing. But, um, I'm excited for it. I do like it. And I like that characters like Booster Gold are getting some kind of, uh, you know, something, some kind of due diligence or attention just because Booster Gold is a great character and has had some fantastic heart wrenching stories that, you know, I feel like people would really gravitate to her if there was given the opportunity. So, and Lanterns is cool. I don't know how I feel about a terrestrial based lantern show but i'm willing to give it a shot you know i i have always liked green lantern but you know we'll see what that ends up being you know because this is just the announcement i think uh, you put it really well i think they're what they're going for is like there's something for everyone and i think that in itself is an advantage because um and when i've been talking about uh mcu uh stuff in the past i think one of the criticisms i have of it is that a lot of it feels very much the same in terms of tone and, and sort of feel. Uh, and I think this slate is kind of a, a way for DC to differentiate itself because uh, while we may not pit them against each other adversarially, I think um, subconsciously audience members do that anyways. Um, so I think it is best for them to perhaps uh, differentiate themselves in some way. And I think this is a good way to do it. And as you said, that synergy between live action and animation is also, I think, an advantage that they're going to have. Um, personally, the the two shows that interest me most in this slate are, are Lanterns and, and Paradise Lost. 
Um, but I do think also, you know, while Booster Gold might not be my favorite character, I think there's a very um, interesting story that could be told uh, with Booster Gold simply because as our our world, our society veers more towards digital technology and, you know, promotion of personal branding and, you know, social media and that type of thing, I think they could do a really thoughtful and as well as comedic take on it. I think it would work really, really well. All right. So now that we know the slate, there was a couple of little updates that came out. Uh, first things first, James Gunn, after the fact, um, talked about some of the influences for some of the upcoming projects. Um, so we're just going to quickly touch on that. Obviously, we mentioned Tom King's Super, Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow as the inspiration for the Supergirl series. But he also listed off All-Star Superman for the Superman Legacy series. Um, Absolute Swamp Thing by Alan Moore. Um, as the influence for Swamp Thing. There was um, Grant Morrison's Batman for The Brave and the Bold. And then there was um, The Authority by Warren Ellis as the uh, influence for the upcoming Authority movie. So needless to say, once he posted that, a lot of these books immediately sold out on Amazon. Um, And then he followed it up by saying he spoke with Jim Lee and DC Comics will be releasing more of this stuff in the future. I think it's smart for a gun to also shine a light on the comics because a lot of times, and I can't say this without with with you know absolute certainty because I'm not watching and paying attention to Marvel the same way as I am the Batman stuff or even DC stuff to that matter. But Marvel, there is certain comics that I know for a fact influence certain projects. Like obviously Civil War had an influence. But from what I know of Civil War, it's not exactly the same thing as obviously what we got in the film. And I'm not saying at all that like these films that we get from DC are going to be direct adaptations of the comics. But you don't really know what is actually influencing some of the Marvel projects and maybe they maybe maybe they do say something maybe they do say you know maybe you know if you are dialed into that stuff as much as we are to this stuff maybe they do but i like the fact that gun shined that light on the comics and said these are the comics that we are taking the inspiration from to create the stuff that we are doing for the future because it's important to showcase the comics and these comic projects. In some cases, some of this stuff has been out for ages and ages and ages, and a lot of people might not even have, have might a lot of people might not have even known about it if it wasn't for something like this shining the light on it. Totally agree. Um, two things. I'll do the quick one first. It's I I appreciate it because you know things like Absolute Swamp Thing is the name of the omnibus, the big the big book. But it also goes by the name of Saga of the Swamp Thing by Alan Moore. And I would argue that is one of the greatest comic books ever written, hands down. It's better than V for Vendetta, better than Watchmen, in my opinion. And everybody should read it. But highlighting things like that that have so much like richness and depth and you know, giving people the opportunity to read these things and explore things about themselves as they're getting into the characters and kind of have a new outlook on life because they're reading something so, you know, richly, you know, written and drawn um, is fantastic. But the other thing too, is I feel like kind of what you were just saying with Marvel is, you know, my impression of what the MCU did, and this is kind of why I really don't pay attention to the MCU too much is they cannibalize and eat a lot of what's popular in the comics, but there's this, not with every creator, and James Gunn didn't have this when he worked for Marvel, but like, there's kind of this attitude of, um, I'm just trying to think of the word I'm looking for, they're kind of distanced themselves a little bit from the comics in terms of like feeling like it's a little silly, you know, or this or that, and it kind of shows in the humor that's in a lot of the MCU movies. You know, just for example, one thing that comes off the top of my head is in uh, the Spider-Man No Way Home when they ask Dr. Octopus his name or whatever. And he says, Otto Octavius, all the kids start laughing, you know, and like as its own thing, that's just like a throwaway joke, but it's kind of something that's in a lot of Marvel movies where these, these weird tongue in cheek jokes at the comic that they're harvesting, but at the same time, they're like, ha ha ha, this is really silly. And it's always put me in a place of, should I take this seriously? Or should I like, how should I approach the movie? And so having this marriage, I feel like from 
you know, James Gunn celebrating and highlighting these things, A, increases their sales, but B, also, I feel like is a better bridging between people who have loved this stuff for a long time and treating it with a certain modicum of respect and value that not everybody would normally approach these projects with. I mean, I agree with that as well. I, I also get that sense from uh, from MCU films. And I think I was commenting on our Discord server the other day when I was thinking about the slate. I think one of the things that's really worked for the Nolan trilogy and for the Matt Reeves film is um, you can actually tell like what comics they, they drew influence from. You can actually like see the elements there. And I think what what they do really well is they take elements from different sort of classic uh, Batman tales and then combine them and to, to portray a narrative that is at, at the same time unique while also still inspired by the comics. And I think to, to do that in a way that takes it seriously uh, is something that requires a lot of skill. And I think uh, it's a good thing that James Gunn has sort of reveal the influences that he's, he's going with right off the top. For one thing, I think the comic creators really appreciate it because, uh, let's be honest, they don't get enough credit for a lot of the, the work they do on these characters that, that get put into the, into the movies. Um, my only concern, I think, would be... Um, I'm, not, I'm not such a big Grant Morrison fan. I, I gotta say that. Uh, I know Gunn is, is leaning very heavily on Grant Morrison influence for this. Um, and I should say, like, I don't actually have a problem with, like, I, I've been rereading some of uh, the Morrison stuff. I don't actually have a problem with, like, the plot points. If you just take it as a story, it's like, oh, this happened, and then this happened, and this happened. It's more his writing and, and how he connects those points and how the characters talk that really sort of gets to me. And I hope, I mean, I just this is me personally speaking, I just hope, like, Gunn is not using that exclusively as an influence for these characters and also incorporates other comics as well. All right. So let's talk about what else he talked about. So he, they talked about what was coming. They said, obviously we've got Shazam. We've got the flash blue beetle Aquaman. Those are, those projects are all coming this specific year. One interesting note that he made about flash is that it does in fact reset the DC universe. So we thought that was going to happen. It is, in fact, happening, um, but it's not resetting everything. It's not starting everything back at square one. And he specifically said, you know, Zachary Levi could play Shazam again after this next Shazam film. Um, Ezra Miller could play him, uh, play The Flash again in a future film. Uh, you know, Jason Momoa could play Aquaman. Um, he left the door open for very specific, you know, very certain specific things. I think the things that are obviously not left open are Henry Cavill as Superman, um, Ben Affleck as Batman, Gal Gadot, who knows, because if they're doing a Wonder Woman series without Wonder Woman, you know, they don't necessarily need Wonder Woman right away. So maybe that's on the back burner for the time being until they figure out what happened. That's what BJ suggested um, in his uh, article, TBU Five Things the uh, DC Studios Rebirth uh, that you can find over on the site. But um, they specifically were talking about that. Then they said the Joker film is coming out in 2024. They said that the Batman Part 2 is coming out in 2025. The Batman uh, Part 2, Joker, Teen Titans Go, and Superman and Lois were the four projects that they currently mentioned that would have an Elseworlds banner on them going forward to specifically state that these are not happening within the confines of the DC universe, um, that, they're, 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 that they're creating as we speak. Interestingly, they didn't mention anything about, and I'm not saying this means anything specific, but they didn't mention the Harley Quinn animated series, they didn't mention Young Justice, and they didn't mention that Gotham Knight series. Everything else has either been canceled or is ending, so there's not really a point to you know dwell on it. But those are the three projects. I'm guessing if Young Justice was to get another season, it would be Elseworlds, I'm sure, because it was already it was always taking place on a different Earth anyway. Um, the Harley Quinn series is the one that's kind of iffy because I don't know for a fact that that one is going to... I don't know that they're going to use that series as the only version of Harley in anything that exists, especially because Harley was in James Gunn's Suicide Squad. So it's hard to believe that that would be the only version. That said, 
it's very likely the series is getting another season and because they've got a, a Valentine's Day special coming out just next week. And then there's also the spin-off series featuring Kite Man that they're doing as well. So I imagine that stuff's going to end up being Elseworlds just because it is conti- it is continuing. Um, and Gotham Knights will probably just you know die on impact, but we'll see what happens. Um, but the one project that came up was the Batgirl film. And interestingly, Peter Safran, he actually stated in an interview uh, by with Variety, he said that the film was not releasable. Now, he did not go into specific details about how it was, you know, how the quality of the film was bad and that's why they weren't doing it or anything like that. But I think what he was hinting at was the fact that based off of the situation that they put themselves in with Michael Keaton as Batman, uh, this brand new Batgirl that had no connection to the existing Batman, I think they realized that there was no way for this film to make sense, which is, of course, what we've said from the very beginning and said that, you know, this film never made sense. But it could also mean that the film was not very good. I mean, I'm I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus here, but the, the movie was written by Christina Hodges, who did the Birds of Prey series, or the Birds of Prey film, which, you know, to each their own. I know some people enjoyed it. I thought it was not as good as Black Adam, and we all know recently I didn't feel that great about Black Adam, so, I mean, there's that. Um it is what it was, but I don't think I think it was a poor representation of a lot of the characters that we would have appreciated a better representation of. Um, so that that was an interesting little tidbit that was released as far as that. Yeah, I mean, he didn't really mince his words, but he's very diplomatic about it. Yep. So I mean, they're going to work with all those people again. He kind of or he you know name dropped quite a few people he wanted to work with again. So you know, I mean, at this point, it's just putting the finishing nail on the coffin I guess like we know it's not coming it's over I don't know yeah I think you you might be right about it just like the movie just not fitting in anymore like in terms of the content of the film not fitting in anymore with what they're doing so that w- that's what makes it unreleasable I think that's definitely possible and probably true but um, part that made me think that he was also saying the movie was bad is if you look at the quote, he says they made a courage, courageous decision to cancel it because it would have hurt DC. It would have hurt those people involved. And I thought that was the interesting bit because people involved seem to have a different idea of it. <laughs> they don't think it would have hurt yeah. them. They kind of want, they kind of wanted it to come out. And then, but uh, he he does say it would have hurt the company. So that to me makes makes it sound like you know it was actually a bad film. But you know it's 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 kind of funny because on the other hand. Uh, apparently, they consider this upcoming Flash film to be like one of the greatest superhero movies ever made. So, I'm not entirely sure how much I I should uh, trust their their ability to evaluate these things. Uh, that being said, I, I personally do think it was a good idea for them not to release Batgirl. So then, leaning back into kind of the the past of what what happened before, um, there was an interview over at the Hollywood Reporter where James Gunn was specifically asked about how, you know, how it is to be dealing with all of the DC films and kind of like, in some ways, the mess that was. Um, He specifically had comments uh, talking about the last 10 years, and it sums it up pretty nicely. He said, as everyone probably knows, the history of DC is pretty messed up. There is the Arrowverse, there is the DCEU, which then split became the Joss Whedon Justice League at one point, became the Snyderverse at the other point. There was Superman and Lois. There's the Reevesverse. There's all these different things, Gunn said at the top of the session. Even us, we came in and did Suicide Squad, and that became Peacemaker, and all of a sudden Batmite is a real guy that never has really been set up. No one was minding the mint. They were just giving away IP like they were party favors to any creators that smiled at them. That comment was like, nah, the icing on the cake for what I hope is a good tenure for James Gunn, because that's exactly how I feel with, more specifically, the Batman characters. I know that it happens outside of the Batman stuff, but it really does feel like a creator comes along, they do something that is is great in someone some executive's eyes, and then they're like, hey, what do you want to do next? And they say, 
I want to do something with DC, and they end up getting something. Uh, case in point, what was it? Um, Gotham was headed by producers from, I believe it was Criminal Minds. And they they did Criminal Minds. It was successful. Or maybe it wasn't Criminal Minds. Um, I think it was the, the Mentalist. Bruno the Mentalist. Howard. Yes, the Mentalist. That's what it was. Um, they did the Mentalist. It was successful. Somehow they end up getting Gotham, and they're doing stuff that, you know, was originally supposed to be a GCPD series. It became something very different because they realized very quickly that they didn't have the writing talent on the series to actually tell the story of the GCPD without all of the rogues. So it just became the the rogues prequel series. And, you know, you look at Zack Snyder, you know, to a degree, he had other successful stuff and he came in and said he wanted to do something like this. Um, and you know, he wanted to do man of steel and then that led into other things. Man of steel was deemed successful. So he was able to do Batman V Superman, Batman V Superman, not necessarily was deemed successful, but they, they already had the justice league, you know, in the pipeline to happen. You know, I, I feel like, and I, I hate to say this, Greg Berlanti, I mean, he makes Warner Brothers an insane amount of money, but every single time there was a character group that he wanted to use or somebody pitched as an idea to like make a TV series, they were doing it. And it didn't necessarily flow together and it didn't necessarily make sense. Um, you look at some of the stuff that's come out, it's not that it's bad. It's not that every single one of these series is bad, but it's just not necessarily connected and it doesn't always make sense. Um, the, there was a lantern, Green Lantern series, I believe it was called Green Lantern Core. Uh, that series was supposed to be, that was another Berlanti one. They officially canceled that and said that's not happening. Um, and I'm pretty sure Berlanti is not going to be dealing with any DC superheroes. That doesn't mean he can't go do other things and be successful for Warner Brothers in other ways, but I think that he that tenure of the Arrowverse and all the other stuff that had to do with it is is done. It's not happening anymore. Um, they had their run, they made a bunch of money, and that's you know that's unfortunately the end for them. But um, it's it, it's very interesting because everything I think of, I think of like. There was all of these exclusive deals that were put in place. Berlanti Productions had a huge, um, you know, exclusive deal with Warner Brothers. Jeff Johns had, uh, you know, a deal at one point, and it was just like, what do you, what, what, what do you want to work on? What makes sense? And to a degree, that still happens because you had like James Wan who has done, who did the, you know, was producer of The Conjuring. Um, and the uh, some of the other horror films that Warner Brothers did, did, and then he came in and he did Aquaman. You had um, I can't his name is escaping my head, but the director of Shazam he came from Annabelle. I mean, they're do you know and and uh, Annie Machete who's who is the who is from it. He's doing the Flash. It's like it, it almost feels like you make a really good film. And somebody says, what do you want to do next? And if you, and it just so happens that it lines up with what they wanted to do, that's what it is. And that's not to say that doesn't happen all over Hollywood. It does. But the problem is that when you get certain people to say yes to things just because a creator wants to be involved, it doesn't make it so that it's, there's a unified front and there needs to be a unified front and there needs to be a cohesive nature to what they're producing. Yeah. It's kind of, I don't know. I, I, get all that i appreciate that and it, it makes sense like it kind of got out of hand i feel like there needs there needs to be a balance and there just wasn't anything it was just kind of what james gunn said it was because you know in theory sometimes that practice works and it works well but in the case of dc movies where you're trying to get people to get back in the theaters every couple of months to watch something that's a continuation like you need some kind of continuity so we know in comics that comic readers don't like it when things go too far out of continuity. So, you know, you need that balance. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Dustin. And I think, I mean, it got so bad that, you know, we did that podcast on Black Adam and it was just kind of like Wild West in terms of people trying to secure their uh, their piece of the pie, so to speak, uh, at, at Warner Brothers. Um, I I also think part of the problem is they were so spread out with the projects that they were doing. And then the projects they were doing were kind of like half-hearted 
like as you said, Gotham it was supposed to be a GCPD show, but it, it became something else. And then, uh, like with the Arrowverse, like um, Arrow, you can tell if you're a comic fan is basically a knockoff Batman show. Like that's what they were really trying to do. And instead of actually doing a Green Arrow show, we're just going to be like, okay, let's do a Batman show, but we're going to reskin it as like Green Arrow and hope no one notices. Uh, I think that's part of the problem. Like, if you're going to do something with characters, do it with the characters properly. Don't try and, like, uh, we can't use this character, so we're just going to, we're going to show you Gotham without Batman. Or we're going to, you can't have, for the longest time they couldn't, they said they couldn't have a a TV version of Batman Superman. And I think in many ways that has deprived us of, of really good versions of these characters. And not to say that the Arrowverse is good, I think... I, this is me personally speaking. I think God that is over because that era of superhero television, I think, has come to an end. I think now we're at a point where um, audiences require higher quality, uh, higher quality writing, higher quality thematic content in their superhero television, and I think we are going to get that um, with the stuff that's coming, uh, like you know, Lanterns, Paradise Lost, or whatever um, they've announced on the TV slate. Um. So, I mean, I think the the point is now not only that they're you're doing it in an organized and purposeful manner, but they're also, like, doing what they say they're going to do and not, you know, the, we're, we were actually going to do something else, but then we'll just kind of repurpose it into some, in something completely different. I think, you know, thankfully Gotham Knights might be the last gasp of that. Yeah, hopefully, because uh, I don't think... I don't think any of us really want that series, and I think uh, that will be like the final coffin in the the past DC mentality of just doing stuff to do stuff. But all right, so with that, that's going to wrap up this episode. Um, hopefully, you guys enjoyed this episode. Um, we'd love to hear your comments on what you guys think of the slate, what you guys are looking forward to the most. I mean, obviously, we're going to be looking forward to The Brave and the Bold for the obvious reasons of it being Batman connected. But I will say that I think the ability to, like, introduce a lot of other characters and expand the DC universe is what I'm looking forward to the most. Um, I like the idea. uh, And I say this because I know that that means that there's a good chance that we could we could finally get a true Bat family on the big screen, which I think would be awesome. Um So with all of that being said, be sure to check out our website. We have all kinds of news, original content, editorials, um, other podcasts. We have reviews of all kinds of different things related to Batman, including movies, TV, merchandise, video games, comics, and everything else related to the Bat fandom. Uh, You can follow us on social media. We are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Discord, YouTube. Uh, All of our social links can be found over at the top of the page at thebatmanuniverse.net. You can get in touch with us by leaving a comment wherever you are listening to this episode. You can also send us an email at tbu at thebatmanuniverse.net. With all that being said, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Uh, For Scott, Otto, and myself, we will see you guys next time.